Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 32 of the Ask Historians podcast. I'm very excited about today's episode because we do have a couple of uh, visiting guests who are here to share their knowledge with us. Uh, we will have Dr. Sarah Reed and Dr. Jennifer Evans who will be talking to us about uh, women's health in the uh, early modern period. So it's kind of a this this kind of liminal period around the 17th century really is a kind of where the nucleus of what we'll be talking about, but extending centuries in either direction as well, uh, where the ideas of kind of modern medical science had not yet really been developed or taken hold, while the ideas of these kind of classical ideas about uh, humoral, Hippocratic, and Galenic systems were still very much in vogue, but uh, having gone through, you know, at this point, millennia of changes in interpretations. Uh, so we're going to look at how these ideas and this kind of uh, this this marketplace of ideas uh, was really uh, applied to women, how they lived, uh, their health, uh, both to uh, diseases they may face. We'll talk about STIs. Uh, we'll talk about or STDs. You may be familiar with them, or if you are a time traveler from the 1940s, that'd be venereal diseases. We will talk about uh, kidney stones and uh, UTIs as well, uh, but we'll also spend time talking about uh, pregnancy and kind of the social impact that that had on women's lives and fulfilling uh, that uh, idea, uh, as well as you know women who who uh, were were infertile and could not have pregnant uh, or could not get pregnant, and you know complications that can arise, but also you know regular things like menstruation. Uh, we'll talk uh, also a little bit about um, the the problem of kind of misdiagnosing or retro diagnosing really past diseases as well. So we'll talk about the whites and how that is kind of hard to pin down exactly what it is, even though, you know, we have a general idea, but it's something that shifts and changes over the years, as well as um, green sickness, uh, which is some, uh, an idea that was new to me that we'll talk, uh, talk about towards the end of the podcast here. So, But I'm, I'm very excited that uh, Dr. Reed and Dr. Evans were able to come and uh, join me on the podcast today and share their knowledge with both myself and with you. Uh, I'm familiar, I, I first became familiar with their work. Um, you know, I'm, I did not attend school over in England, so I've never you know, been in one of their classes or attended one of their lectures. I'm familiar with them from the, uh, the History of Medicine subreddit. Um, which is a lovely little community that could use a little more love. So if you are interested in that topic, please go by and, and check it out. But they are frequent contributors. They are posting articles from their own blog that they run, uh, earlymodernmedicine.com. Um, I will put links to all this in, in the show notes and uh, the discussion post as well. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, but I encourage you mightily, mightily to check out their blog, uh, read articles that they have published, buy books that they have published. It's a fascinating topic, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Ask Historians podcast. Today, I'm here with Dr. Jennifer Evans and Dr. Sarah Reed. Uh, Dr. Evans is a lecturer of history at the University of Hertfordshire. Uh, her research focuses on gender, the body, medicine, and uh, early modern England, uh, particularly dealing with uh, health, sex and reproduction, uh, as well as marriage, family, and medical practitioners. Uh, she completed her doctoral thesis at the University of Exeter in 2011, uh, looking at infertility and the understanding of aphrodisiacs. And uh, shortly after that, started a postdoctoral research fellowship with the Society of Renaissance Studies looking at the relationship between masculinity and men's sexual health in early modern England. Um, and Dr. Reed is a lecturer of uh, the English department, and I, I hope I get this, uh, this very particularly English name correct, Loughborough University. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I nailed it there. Uh, she also has uh, done a postdoctoral uh, research fellowship for the Society of Renaissance Studies uh, and published her first monograph, Menstruation in the Female Body in Early Modern England in 2013, uh, looking at women's understanding of transitional bleeding. Uh, and currently is working on projects uh, looking at female obesity in early modern England. So uh, Dr. Reed and Dr. Evans, welcome. And I should also point out that you are both contributors to the Early Modern Medicine blog, um, which is, of course, earlymodernmedicine.com for those who want to uh, check it out. I'll put up links in the discussion post as well. So uh, Dr. Evans and uh, Dr. Reed, uh, whichever one, if you would like to go first, uh, what got you interested in this particular area of, of history and medicine? Do you want to go first, Sarah? Yeah, I don't mind. Um... My interest was sparked when I was doing my MA studies, um, which was into early modern writing. And we started looking at medical texts as one of the forms of writing because unlike now where scientific language often is very different from everyday language, one of the things about medical textbooks at the time is that they're written in um, using the rhetorical skills that, that uh, medical men often learned at university, very flamboyant language, 
and often indistinguishable from other forms of literature which made them interesting to study and then I was hooked. Um, my kind of route into things is actually very similar um, but I started looking at the body uh, as an undergraduate student in my third year. It was actually um, by fluke I'd applied to do a different course and it was full so I ended up on a course about bodies and sexualities and I think about five minutes in I realised this was the only thing I ever wanted to, to study again um, and so that's how I kind of got into looking at the body. I then as time went on became much more interested in medical texts um, for very similar reasons as to as Sarah and um, the texts produced in the 17th century are just they're just wonderful um, and very very interesting in so many different ways and they suck you in and they don't let you back out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so you bring kind of an important point. So when we are talking about early modern medicine or late medieval medicine, what, what time period are we really going to be talking about here today? Well, my research focuses primarily on the 17th century, and I tend to start looking at things around the mid-16th century. Um, but I think it's generally usual for early modernists to start at the beginning of the 16th century. Yeah, I'm the same. I thought 1540 is, a, is an important date um, in what because one of the texts that I use a lot, a midwifery guide was published then. So I often sort of keep that as my start date and then go up into the mid 18th century or perhaps the 1730s, not quite the mid 17th, 18th century, but mainly 17th century, like Jen. And, and so at this point, what kind of you know uh, theories of medical practice and kind of medical schema are we seeing uh, being uh, proposed both amongst uh, kind of the, the academics who are studying at the time and the physicians and things like that? Um, you know, is this still kind of the Galenic humoral, Hippocratal uh, humoral system? Yeah, very much so. Um, medicine at this time is very much informed by this system. As you've just said, it was first put out by Hippocrates and then Galen regularized it some more. Um, and held that the body was really maintained its health by a system of um, four fluids that had to be kept in balance at all times, which is why cures such as bloodletting were popular, because if you had too much blood, then it was obvious that you needed to take some out. Um, so really, um, at this time, it underpinned most people's understanding of how the body worked and what it needed to stay well. Yeah, alongside um, the humoral theory, you also get miasmatic theory of disease and medicine being perpetuated at this time where putrefaction and decay were thought to release bad smells that they could then seep into the body and cause putrefaction and disease inside the body and so you get lots of uh, interesting things about how smells affect the body but there's this sense that the body is very permeable to its environment and um, which I'm going to come back to talk a bit about later with infertility as well. And so, what was the what was the actual medical training for? I guess you know physicians at this time. You know, do we do we have standard texts? I would assume you know Hippocrates and Galen, but this is also after the translation movement, which is you know brought you know brought uh, old Greek texts and kind of new commentaries from the Islamic world back into Europe as well. So you know, what would the formal schooling for a, a medical practitioner at this time be? If you went to university, you did several years studying all sorts of um, different subjects, and then medical training came at the end of that after a number of years reading lots of other subjects. There's lots of um, texts being used at this time, as you say, you know, the, the 17th century follows the Renaissance when there's been a great kind of reclaiming of Greek texts um, that have been either translated through the Arabic world and then back into, into Latin and brought into the kind of um, fold of university training. But there's also um, a lot of uh, anatomical dissection going on in the early modern period so there's lots of kind of push towards new knowledge and understanding the body both through a theoretical knowledge gained from books and um, anatomical dissection and kind of seeing and practicing medicine. Yeah and um, Vesalius's um, illustrated anatomy was groundbreaking in the mid 16th century for doing just that for actually anatomizing and drawing pictures of human bodies which was something that was unimaginable really before. Yeah, and I do want to come back to that, uh, you know, the, the idea of, of, you know, actually incorporating what we would just kind of call basic anatomy classes, I guess you could say, um, into the, the medical practitioner at the time. But, you know, we're talking a bit about, um, you know, people going to university and reading kind of Greek and Latin texts. Um, but do we also have a kind of a split between what we see, you know, in these uh, authoritative medical texts and what are being practiced kind of locally as well? I think it, it depends where you look. You obviously have in England 
physicians and practitioners who've been to university and are then practicing medicine or writing medical treatises. Um, and not everybody who's writing medical texts is actually practicing medicine at the same time. And then you have other kinds of medical practitioners and historians have increasingly been talking about early modern England being a place of a, a medical marketplace where you have lots of different types of practitioners. So midwives who are maybe regulated by the church or have been trained through apprenticeship, um, apothecaries and surgeons who've also been trained through apprenticeship rather than going to university. Um, although many of those also read Latin um, and read medical texts. But the distinction between people practicing medicine and elite medicine, I think is very, very blurred. You might see a split depending on expense and cost and if you can afford a very wealthy practitioner to treat you. But in many cases, the line is is not clear. And so you get medical writers um, like Jacob Ruff, for example, who wrote on midwifery. And he actually records in his book, um, while talking about infertility, that some old women likewise have their signs by which they observe whether the greater sterility or unfruitfulness be in the husband or the wife, which suggests that he does draw some distinctions between what medical practitioners who've been to university would do and what other kinds of practitioners would do. But then on the other side, you have people like John Pesci in 1695, who, writing about abortion, explains that our ordinary women frequently use plantain seed um, taken in wine or egg or broth to treat abortion and that they have good success with it. So it seems like for most practitioners, they're willing to adopt um, remedies that are known through experience um, rather than through medical theory. And likewise, people treating themselves or their friends or family are also willing to take um, prescriptions from doctors and keep them and adapt them and write them down in their own medical collections. So we see that Mary Glover in the late 17th century writes out a list of um, virtues for certain herbs that she's found in Culpeper, which is a very popular medical text. So there's this blurring of practice um, and theory right the way through from the top to the bottom. Yeah, and it should be as well borne in mind that there was very, very few um, physicians really on the ground, medically trained men um, who people could consult. And then there was the cost element, of course, being much more expensive than going to see the um, apothecary or chemist to get something made up or making it up yourself. People did um, consult, often they consulted um, aristocratic women, for example, who kept a commonplace book full of medical receipts that they might have inherited from their from her own mother in turn and written down cures that she found helpful. And for example, you've got um, the clergyman, Ralph Jocelyn, who goes to visit um, Lady Honeybourne and gets treatment for his wife and children from her. So that's another form of medical treatment that's going on as well. But very, very few people would have had access probably to um, a university trained physician at the time. So we've been talking a lot about uh, really touching on the fact of you know women keeping you know books of medical receipts and particular interest in in women's problem. But I think when most people think about, particularly in this time period, think about medical practice, they they really kind of think of it as a incredibly male dominated world. And reading uh, you know Galenic texts and things like that, it it seems as though uh, sometimes women are treated as as kind of aliens that have come from nowhere and get kind of a, a side chapter to their own. But uh, so you know what kind of were the ideas? Is about um, you know male and female gender as relating to the practice of, of medicine at this time. I mean, I was just thinking then when you said that about Aristotle's idea about women being sort of deformed men, if you like, imperfect um, birth accidents. But Aristotle does say that they're happy accidents because we do need women for the perpetuation of the human race. So it's a good job they occur, but they are sort of, if you like, imperfect men because they didn't um, have sufficient heat in the womb to fully develop into males. So that's one view of how women came into being. There's lots and lots of discussion about this this very issue in books and articles at the moment. I've been I've been reading a lot about this time reviewing one of the latest books on this very topic. And the other suggestion alongside Aristotle is that Galen um, had suggested a one sex model where the woman was merely an inverted form of the man. And if she became hot enough, her reproductive organs would pop out of their body and would look just like a man's. Um, Thomas Lecoeur in 1995 suggested that there was a shift from that kind of one sex understanding of gender where men and women's bodies were fundamentally the same and you could change sex 
through to the 18th century, where you suddenly get the rise of two different sexes, um, and men and women's bodies are understood as fundamentally different. And this has coloured a lot of what historians um, and literary scholars have looked at in terms of sex and gender, and it it perpetuates this idea that women were kind of a sideline or an imperfect or or an other compared to the normal perfect male body. Um, But now scholars are starting to investigate this a lot more and look at it in more detail. And Helen King has recently written really eloquently about how Galen's initial statement about this kind of one sex body was more of a thought experiment and a teaching device rather than him ever actually saying he believed there was a one sex body. And she's gone through and looked at both the classical world and the early modern period and shown that things were much, much more complicated and medical practitioners could both simultaneously talk about women as an imperfect version of a man or as having the same bodies as men, while at the same time acknowledging that they're totally different and have different physiological processes like menstruation that need to be thought about in a completely separate way. So it gets very, very complicated and very, very muddled when you try and think about how women's bodies were conceptualised as compared to men's. One of the things about this um, idea of women's bodies being like men's is because this is a society where literacy rates were quite low and people use symbols quite often. So often saying something like the ovaries, which the function of which wasn't fully understood until the 19th century, but saying the ovaries are like the testicles, it was to, it was more of a metaphor effect. So you could picture what the testicles were like and, and it gave you that visual representation. And I think that's something that's being explored more now as well. It's like, um, certainly from the 16th century onwards where emblems were hugely important. This is a society that understood things if they could get um, a visual image to work from. So like means, you know, as in it's, it's a frame of reference, if you like, more than it means it, it is the same thing. And actually, I want to at this point. I, I want to loop back around to uh, dissection, which is uh, not an ominous statement at, at, at whatsoever. <laughs> but uh, so, how much of this kind of developing uh, idea of of women's and men's bodies is as as separate um, at this time? It's because it sounds like there's a bit of a divergence kind of going on from this idea of this uh, past idea of imperfect men uh, equals women uh, into men and women are, are separate bodies. So how much of that is actually happening as a result of these anatomical studies? You know, do we do we actually even see women's bodies being dissected the same kind of rate as men's? Dissection so um, in early modern England uh, usually happens to the bodies of criminals um, and far fewer women are executed at this time because they can plead the belly so they can plead um, pregnancy and they won't be executed if they're pregnant and so women's bodies were more difficult to get hold of um, but there were lots of anatomical investigations going on into both the female and the male reproductive organs and I think that is a part of of what changes those ideas about sex and gender. So you have William Harvey who starts to think about women as producing eggs. Um, And on the continent, you have um, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek who gets a microscope and starts looking at semen under the microscope and and discovers uh, what we would call spermatozoa or what he calls animalcules. Um, And so there are lots of discoveries being made about how reproduction happens at this time. But there are also other discussions going on about female skeletons versus male skeletons and the differences between those. But I think dissection does have something to do with it. Um, As Sarah said, dissection of human bodies was relatively new to the the late medieval and early modern period. And so it's now that they're starting to see the errors in the Hippocratic and Galenic texts that have been mostly based on the dissection of animals. Um, and so I do think it is part of it, but it's also tied into to broader issues of, of society and culture and, and how they are viewing men and women more generally. So one of the first things that these dissections played was that the wound just had the one chamber, whereas previously they'd been thought to have multiple chambers, you know, with male children growing up in one side and female in another and this sort of thing. So one of the immediate things that was found to be wrong from studying animal an- anatomy op- as opposed to human anatomy was the um, actual structure of the female reproductive system. 
Yeah, actually, so that brings up a good point, and, and this touches on what uh, you were saying as well, Dr. Evans, about you know, these changing ideas about how, you know, actual pregnancy, which of course is, I mean, if, if you are going to have a happy accident of women being necessary to carry on the, uh, the human species, pregnancy is kind of the most, I guess, visible and dramatic way of having that done. I mean, do we have changing ideas about the way that pregnancy actually worked at this time? And um, and kind of secondarily to that question is, was it actually linked to this time to menstruation as well? Very much so, yeah. I mean, the, the, there's a classical phrase in the 17th century that certainly Jane Sharp uses in her midwifery book from 1671, that fruit follows flowers. Um, flowers was the most popular name for menstruation at that time. And it is connected, I think, to the sort of horticultural idea that uh, being fruitful and planting seed and, and things growing and this sort of thing. So, yeah, it was thought very much that you had to have a healthy, regular menstrual cycle in order to conceive and to maintain a healthy pregnancy. Do, but do we still have the idea of, and I think this is probably my own kind of vague idea about how this kind of Galenic idea of pregnancy worked, that uh, of the of the, the sperm being kind of itself the, the vital essence that would uh, kind of implant and grow within the woman and the woman being more kind of the... Uh, the field upon which the the fruit will grow, yeah. I guess you could say. Well, that that's the Aristotel Aristotelian theory there of the agent and patient. It was often called, or the field metaphor, where the woman was much more passive in the reproductive process, and the womb nurtured the semen, which was the whole matter of the fetus, if you like. Whereas the Galanic model required both male and female um, to ejaculate and a seed to combine. So it was much more. Um, equal in that model. In fact, Thomas Reynolds in the 16th century says, you know, if you think of it in them sort of terms, the woman provides more matter for the infant than the male because she not only has to provide the seed, but she then has to nurture and use her own lifeblood to, um, for the embryo to develop into a baby. So there were two, two models really about conception. Importantly with that, no matter which model people were following, it was always kind of implicitly understood that it was the the male seed um, and the male contribution to conception that imparted a soul to the new child. Um, so men were always given little ways in which they were seen as more important. So women's bodies were understood to be inherently slightly colder than men's and heat was considered vital for conception and again men's seed was thought to be the most potent the most prolific and the hottest and it was that that helped to spark a new life so they debate um quite often who's giving more to conception and, and pregnancy and childbirth and who has the bigger role but they always seem to want to come back to this idea that actually it's men who are the most important and i think part of that comes out of their fear that um if women had everything as in the Galenic model they have seed they have a womb they have menstrual blood then there was nothing to stop her having a child on her own and men would be kind of entirely superfluous to the entire process and I think there is some concern about where do men actually fit in the role of reproduction because you see it all in the woman's body she gets pregnant she swells she gives birth it's all very clearly connected to the woman whereas the man is kind of a little more intangible and I think they like to try and find ways to reassert the male role in reproduction. Yeah, so this, I mean, this is very much kind of a, a male-dominated field looking at uh, women's natural functions and, and, women's, uh, and women's health issues. I mean, do we have um, any kind of particularly uh, uh, kind of, I, I guess you, I don't want to say laughable because these are you know, learned men back in the past, but at this point would be laughable. I mean, do we have kind of some more outrageous examples of just missing, missing the point, I guess you could say, that would seem obvious if we had... Um, you know, uh, women writing these learned texts as well, as opposed to simply being a male-dominated kind of academic field. There's a hilarious quote in um, James Drake's 1707 um, anatomy book, in which he repeats all the myths that have been going around since the time of Pliny, the Roman historian, that talks about the poisonous nature of menstrual blood and how, you know, if a dog was just be passing and licks them off the ground, it would immediately get um, rabies and things like this. And, and James Drake says there, that he's only repeating these myths in order to show how ridiculous they are. But women at all times would have laughed at them. And, he ha and that's actually written in his book. So it suggests that there's a difference between people who believe theoretical ideas about poison and what actually people, you know, on the ground thought. I think there's also not necessarily something that men believed in and women didn't, and it would make a difference if women were writing the text, but perhaps something that seems slightly more outrageous to, to modern readers is the belief um, in maternal impressions. And so they believe that during 
pregnancy and and during conception that what a woman thinks about will imprint itself on the child and so you see these um, slight concerns as Mary Fussell has written about that that women could cheat on their husbands but as long as they were thinking about the husband that while they were having sex with their lover they would still produce a baby that looked like their husband but you also see this manifested as um, women's desires for particular foods during pregnancy. Strawberries seem to be a particularly common one or, or rabbit um, will produce birthmarks that look like strawberries on the baby or in the case of rabbits may produce a child with a hair lip. And so they believe there's this very strong connection between the mother's imagination and what the eventual child will look like. You know, we've really been focusing a lot on, on uh, birth and pregnancy here, um, which I would assume would be a kind of a core central role to uh, any woman's uh, identity and place in society at this time. But what about you know, the effects of menopause or, uh, or infertility? You know, women who have moved beyond that role or women who are, uh, I guess you could say, unable to fulfill that kind of social role? Um, well, infertile women have been my kind of area of research for far too long so I could probably talk about this all day um, but both Sarah and I have spent a lot of time thinking about how reproduction feeds into women's roles and becoming uh, a mother was was not the be all and end all of a woman's a woman's identity um, Garthine Walker has written some wonderful history about the way that women's work actually shaped their identity outside of reproduction but becoming a mother kind of inculcated women into a group of married women in their community and they would all attend each other's births and discuss um, reproduction and, and gossip. They were known as gossips. Um, and so it was part of, of reaching that kind of pinnacle of, of social acceptance. And it wasn't the be all and end all, but women who were infertile and so were unable to fulfill that kind of role did tend to suffer. Um, and they could be ridiculed and mocked um, by by the people around them and you find this in in pamphlets and jests and stories from the early modern period um, and one pamphlet called Fumbler's Hall um, which actually tells you in the title that it suggests the man actually has the problem rather than the woman contains the stories of, of several fictional women who weren't able to get pregnant because of their husbands being fumblers. And one wife um, in the book complains that she was taunted and jeered by her neighbours who called her a barren doe. And a second wife then complains that while her husband was very loving, that she considered that not enough and cried out, will love beget such beautiful children as my neighbour K or my neighbour B has? No, no love will not do it alone. And so these women are, are kind of struggling with this shame and ridicule and we also find hints of it in um, women's diaries. So Sarah Savage records in her diary how much she envied her sister who had conceived very soon after her marriage while she'd remained childless for some time. Um, and she actually writes in the end and prays, I pray to God that he will make me a fruitful vine. And so she feels very despondent that she, she hasn't fulfilled that kind of role. And I think that's reflected in medical texts concerns about infertility and the sheer number of remedies and suggestions that they offer to couples to try and a diagnose infertility and b to treat it what exactly were they really diagnosing at this, this point you know what was the understanding of what was causing infertility i mean clearly it could not be the the man's semen because we've already established that being the, the strongest most powerful force on earth at this point so um, <laughs> what are we really, you know, when, when they were saying you're infertile, are they, they saying, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, this kind of focus on like love. Was mm -hmm. there saying like there needs to be a greater emotional connection or were they tying it into um, more kind of spiritual aspects or even to more kind of biological aspects as well? I think, I think it's a, a, yeah, I think it's a common misconception from people in the present thinking about this issue in the past that that it, they had a very basic understanding of infertility. Um, Sarah can fill you in a lot on the, the religious aspects in a moment, but they do acknowledge that, that love is necessary. Um, as Sarah said, under the Galenic model, both partners need to ejaculate a seed. They need to experience pleasure during sex and they need to enjoy it. And so if there's no enjoyment, they understand that, that people won't get fertile. And one medical writer actually writes quite a, a I think what I'd describe it as a rant, um, in his book about parents forcing their daughters to marry men they don't love because it will it will end the family line and there'll be no children. But they also go beyond that and 
and they do look at a range of physiological and um, physical things that will cause infertility. So they do look at um, incompatibility of, of partners in terms of the humoral composition of their seed. If you have two partners that are too hot and dry, then, then their seed will burn up and it, it won't become a child. And those issues in both partners individually. They also think about physical deformities, uh, a woman's vagina being too narrow and not accepting the seed. And one of the things I've most recently been looking at is it's it's often said by historians and others that infertility in the past was always blamed on women. As long as the man was able to have and sustain an erection, then everything else was clearly the woman's fault. And that simply isn't true. They acknowledge that a man can producing, be producing weak, watery seed that isn't strong enough to, to stimulate a conception. And they acknowledge a whole range of issues that can happen to men, including a loss of libido um, and what they call uh, frigidity in both partners, where both partners are cold and lack sexual desire and pleasure. So there's a whole range of things that they think cause infertility. And Dr. Reed, the, thing, the religious I, aspect then? Oh, yeah. Um, before I go to the religious aspect, though, to keep on the line of behaviour, one of the things that they thought could make you infertile worked worked for some women. If you were a prostitute, for example, it was thought that you didn't get pregnant because you had too much sex and this made your womb too slippery to retain the seed. So that was like a good side effect, if you like, of that for them who didn't actually want to conceive. But on a more serious note, in the in terms of fertility, I think that you have to remember at this time that religion informs everybody's everyday thoughts to some extent on a social level for everybody. And as we've alluded to in earlier examples, people did pray for help, like Sarah Savage prayed that she was made a fruitful vine, taking her words straight from scripture. And that was a very common reaction. Mary Rich um, had two children when she was first married, so she wasn't much older than a teenager. And late, when she got into her late 30s, both of these children had died or and she, she and her husband hoped that she was still young enough to have some more children. But this didn't happen. And she decided it was God punishing her for being too vain. Because when she had the children young, she childly thick, she says. So her waist thickened. And she didn't want to spoil her looks by having any more children. There were also practical considerations. She was married to a second son. So they didn't have a lot of money. But she says that it was really it was her vanity that stopped her from wanting to have any more children. And then by the time she's in her late 30s, and this is a problem because they haven't got an heir, she thinks God's crossed with her and that and showing her how wrong she was. And she says that she now accepts that that's God's will. And this is a very sort of very common reaction. The first thing that people do when they hear that they might be pregnant is often offer thanks. So some of the men that um, Jen and I have talked about in our miscarriage article first pray when they hear that their wives have conceived and hope that the you know the pregnancy will go well. The first thing that a midwife did when she attended a woman would be offer a prayer. So in terms of infertility then it's natural that this too would be something that people would would view from a religious framework and often think was a punishment for their behaviour. You mentioned prayer, but you know we've diagnosed infertility at this point from a, a variety, you know, a multifactorial kind of approach. Um, but what were the actual kind of uh, treatments for, for infertility at this time? Um, the range of treatments varied dramatically depending on, on what your problem was. So I won't go into all of those because, again, we would be here for most of the year, I think, if I tried to cover everything. Um, but there are there are some popular options. Um, one popular option is to uh, take whatever treatment will cure a disease that is causing your infertility. And one disease that, that Sarah knows an awful lot more about than me that was very much linked to barrenness was, was called the whites, which was an excessive um, vaginal discharge, which again made the womb slippery. So you might take the treatments that were recommended for that, and then hopefully that would clear up your infertility. Um, a second very popular option was to visit the baths um, and drink the waters and, and sit in the waters to help cure your infertility. And this became particularly popular following um, the visits of several royals to the to the baths for their infertility. And there's a fantastic medical text um, written by Robert Pierce called The Bath Memoirs. And it's his memoirs of 40 years of practicing medicine at the baths. And he, he includes a whole chapter about women who have come to the baths in order to, to conceive an heir or conceive a new child. On top of that, another general way to improve fertility is 
is to take aphrodisiacs and to eat aphrodisiacs. And this always um, surprises modern audiences because we tend to think of aphrodisiacs as only connected with lust. But because of that need for pleasure to release seed um, and to stimulate heat in the body, um, desire is thought of as heat, hot, um, whether that's from friction or just generally feeling hot and bothered. Um, the heat in that becomes an important part of of aphrodisiac treatment. So a lot of people are eating aphrodisiacs to help improve their fertility, not just their ability to have sex. So there's lots of different things that people can do to to improve their fertility. Dr. Reed, do you want to go on about uh, the the whites, since that seems to be an interesting uh, interesting little sidebar there? It's called, um, so the whites then, uh, leucorrhea, the medical name for a non-specific vaginal discharge, and that's the thing. It could cover a whole range of of things that we would now give different names or or be able to through lab work realize have different causes such as thrush for example um, and that's one of the things actually it's a useful point to to sort of talk about why retro di- diagnosis just doesn't work you can't map modern diseases onto say the whites like that and say oh, oh it was perhaps this disease or perhaps that because the things that you go to your doctor and report as symptomatic might be com- entirely different to what you might have reported to your physician in the 17th century. Things that struck you as important might not have struck somebody as important then and vice versa. So this is any sort of non-specific um, vaginal discharge which should take all sorts of um, different forms and was generally put down to sort of having too much phlegm. Phlegm is one of the four humours, the four main bodily humours, but it was a nice catch-all one. So any sort of any clear discharge was due to you being too phlegmatic so you know anything from a runny nose to crying a lot or something might mean that you'd got too much uh, of that humor um, and same with um same with the whites it's one of these terms that also changes during our period in the early part certainly in the 16th century early early part of the 17th century latin names are more prevalent so it was, the whites was known as flor albus latin for white later later in the um, towards the 18th century it turns into leucorrhea as the greek roots or greek derivations take over so it's an interesting that it's the same disease but it just changes its name like so many do lazar riviera's description of it is quite typical he says a woman is said to have the whites the woman's flux the flux of the womb or the white menstruals when excrementious humors do flow from her womb so any sort of excess phlegm that arrives in the womb through whatever means would be designated the whites, but it's interesting that they can call it the white menstruals as well because it's coming from the womb. That that phlegm itself is kind of almost a, a non-specific uh, thing at this point because, you know, you say that it, it could potentially be an infection or something like that, and I'm thinking, okay, you know, the whites. Okay, we're thinking, you know, a, a candida infection perhaps, but, uh, <laughs> you know, would they be interpreting that as uh, well as, as the excess phlegm? Yeah, exactly that. Yeah. Because they didn't know from where it came, so they just assumed that, like everything, if, if humoral medicine is underpinning your entire rationale for how your body works and you've got an excess of, of one humour quite visibly, then you need to do something to re- redress your balance. And um, Jen knows lots of cures for this sort of thing that you could use to dry out the excess phlegm and, then, and therefore cure um, the whites. Yeah, so, so Jen, uh, let's assume that I myself am suffering from the whites, however improbably that may be. Seems <laughs> <laughs> um, <you> unlikely. Know, <laughs> yeah. just, to, just to use this as kind of a case study, who, who would I go to um, and, and what, would, what would I be prescribed? Um, well, I think if you're a woman, you might turn to um, a female friend or a recipe book owned by a female friend first. And you would be prescribed something that would would be drying. Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember any specific remedies for the whites, but anything anything that was seen as kind of astringent or drying or or would close that space and stop the flow would be recommended. I think the interesting thing for women with these kinds of conditions, which we've already suggested, is that they they can experience shame and and embarrassment. Um, And there's lots of concern in the early modern period about women revealing their reproductive bodies to a male medical practitioner. And there's kind of two aspects to this. The first one is shame. And a medical writer called John Sadler produced a book called The Sick Woman's Private Looking Glass. And he claimed that women were needlessly suffering from hysteric diseases, which um, hysteric meant of the womb. So anything to do with their womb, both because of their own ignorance and because, as he says, 
her modesty being loath to divulge and publish the same unto a physician to implore his aid. She conceals her grief and increases her sorrow. Um, and one early modern joke even implied that ignorance and shame on the part of women could lead to them being sexually exploited. Um, and the joke suggests that, uh, as they call him, a petulant doctor of physic convinced one girl that he needed to have sex with her to break eggs that she was breeding. Um, and of course, she doesn't understand any of that terminology. So she goes along with the plan until she ends up pregnant. There were also concerns of about sexual exploitation, not just in terms of a physician having sex with a woman, but also touch and sight being used as a way to, to gratify the male practitioner's sexual urges. And Winfred Schneiner has written about how Renaissance medical practitioners become increasingly concerned about the potential erotic touch of manipulating the female genitals. Um, and this is done by both uh, midwives um, and others to to expel excess seed that's building up inside a woman's body if she's not engaging regularly in sexual intercourse. Um, so there are concerns about seeing a medical practitioner. Um, it's important to point out that for most women, most of the time, those kinds of concerns wouldn't ultimately stop them seeking medical help. Maybe for some women it did, but most women would eventually seek the help that they needed. And they do see ma male practitioners as, as well as other women. But there's, there's lots of issues to think about in seeking medical help. And of course, in the whites, there's, a, there's another element to this. Of course, there's um, the idea that people might think that you've got a sexually transmitted disease if you've got a problem with discharge mm -hmm. in that area. John Murphy's book, which is about specifically about gonorrhea, says the whites in women and cap are accompanied with signs so alike that physicians are almost deceived and know not most times how to discern one from the other, especially when they meet with designing women who, to save their reputations, would cover their whoredom with a pretense that it's the whites. So he turns it back immediately and says that, um, you know, it's enough to almost trick a physician, but um, that women might pretend to have the whites when actually they know fine well that they've actually got a, a sexually transmitted disease. So it's very, very difficult to diagnose, but it's also going to put you off going to the doctor if you think um, as a respectable married woman perhaps that you might be a thought of a, as having contracted some sort of venereal disease. You've both brought up kind of this idea of kind of shame as well and particularly with the idea of catching a disease and I, I think one of the common one of the common ideas about uh, this mo this you know early modern period is that basically everyone had syphilis. Um, so, you know, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, that this, this time period is just rife with the sexually transmitted diseases. So, um, you know, do we have uh, specific uh, practices or, or, or ideas about how these were transmitted uh, or how these took hold in the body? Venereal diseases is really an interesting one for talking about precisely that kind of idea about how diseases take hold because it very, very rapidly becomes apparent to both medical practitioners and the general populace that, that this is something that is spread through through sexual contact. Um, but having said that, there were initially a whole range of other explanations for venereal disease. And one is obviously that, that God has sent it as a punishment for sexual sin um, and sexual impropriety, but also that an alignment of Mars and Jupiter has caused this noxious vapor to appear that is, is causing venereal disease. But on an individual scale, there are also suggestions um, that venereal disease might be caught by simply sharing a bed with someone or, or a toilet seat or, or drinking from the same cup as them. And as medical practitioners increasingly acknowledge that this is a sexually transmitted disease, and I say a sexually transmitted disease because they include gonorrhea in syphilis and think it's kind of the first stage and that it can then develop into full-blown syphilis, so they don't always separate them out. But as they acknowledge this, several medical writers include in their books that there are these other explanations, these innocent explanations to do with sharing cups and things, and that you shouldn't necessarily discredit those because it may stop people coming forward and telling you they have a venereal disease. Whereas if you allow these kind of 
suggestions that maybe they caught it some other way that they will be a bit more open and a bit more willing to tell you that actually they do have a venereal disease. And one of the things I'm finding in my new research project on men's sexual health is that medical practitioners and surgeons who are often the ones who are treating venereal disease have lots of problems with men who just don't want to admit that that's what they've got. And they'll say that they've overindulged in food or that they've they've got some other kind of distemper or disorder and the medical practitioner, the surgeon has to push and push and push and interview them repeatedly saying, are you sure you haven't got a venereal disease? And eventually when it's clear that their their treatment is never going to work, they'll admit to the fact that, yes, okay, I've got a venereal disease and I need to be put on anti-venereal medication. Uh, which at this point, I, I guess would be, I mean, are we, are we still seeing things, I mean, are we still seeing the, or beginning to see the use of say mercury or arsenic at this time? I guess mercury. Yeah, mercury is most often um, used um, either applied to the body as a, as a paste or used as a fume and people would sit over the fume and, and be wrapped up so to, to induce sweating. And I think one of the very sad things about the use of mercury is that often the consequences of mercury treatment are just as disfiguring and dangerous as syphilis was in the first place. So people's noses and palates collapse and they they come out in new fresh ulcers and their hair might fall out and and they they suffer quite terribly while going through mercury treatment and of course they tend to think then that they were cured because of the mercury because one of the things about syphilis is that it does go into remission before coming back out so instead of thinking that it had come back out like we would perhaps do um, people would think they'd re-caught it reinfected themselves and that the mercury was a was a cure and they needed to go back and have it again but when we were talking about um, the problem women might have in presenting with this illness, as an example, I've just um, recalled from John Hall's me- medical notes. He was um, a Warwickshire physician, and he tra- treated a lady called Mrs. Harvey, who he says is now a lady because he's writing his notes retrospectively. He says she's very religious, and to, to note that in your casebook might seem anomalous to us, but you know it just sets the framework that this wouldn't be somebody who was presenting. With a, with a sexually transmitted disease that she was covering up as a white. So he says, Mrs. Harvey, now lady, very religious, five weeks after child work birth, was vexed with a great flux of whites and also pain and weakness of the back, which is a classic symptom of the whites that all doctors talk about. And his cure for Mrs. Harvey was to give her some dates, as many as you please, cut them small with purified honey and make an electric, um, which she used in the morning. And he says that this, this perfectly cured her from the white, stopped them, and it made her fat, which is, she was pleased about. <laughs> so, you know, actually, one of the things you just mentioned there uh, caught my ear, the idea that uh, this, this pain in, in the lower back as well, which, of course, we would think is a, a classic sign of a, of a urinary tract infection. Um, yeah. So, I mean, do we, do we have the idea of, of, of this as a, a particular disease as well, or was it wrapped up into all these kind of other, um, you know, symptomatic di- uh, diagnoses? I was going to say, urinary tract infections are often called st- st- stang. Uh, how do you say it, Jen? St- stangery? Oh, uh, strangery, yeah. I was going to talk about the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you go on then. <laughs> um, so, yes, although they don't necessarily use the terms of, of a urinary tract infection, there are lots and lots of uh, discussions in medical texts about various painful inflammations um, and urinary problems. So you have um, dysuria, strangury, which is seen as a very painful urination, often coming in drops. And you have discussions about people who who clearly feel the urge to urinate having only just been, and that tends to be accompanied with heat um, as well. And so they, they definitely know that there are things that can go wrong with the urinary tract. And they also spend a lot of time talking about kidney stones and bladder stones, which often cause tears or, or irritation. And so there, there's lots and lots of very nasty things going on with people's urinary systems. So we've been talking a great deal about kind of dysfunction and infections and things like that. But I mean, what about uh, basic medical care in you know natural functions, such as in pregnancy? Not every pregnancy, of course, uh, uh, goes smoothly. Um, and so do we have particular ideas about, first of all, you know, why you might have something as uh, like, like a miscarriage or why you might have something like a stillbirth or why you might have something uh, well, like a pregnancy that, that uh, ends with the mother's death? Do we have particular understandings about these sorts of things? 
Oh, definitely. And one of the, it comes back to religion again, as often as a per, first point of call, that you, you know, if you do something sinful, you might be punished by a miscarriage. And if you could learn the lesson from that and take on board the message and modify your behavior and become more religious, then, you know, your next pregnancy might be more successful. So there's a spiritual aspect to it, but there's also lots of physical lots of physical things too yeah lots of um physical causes for miscarriage um revolve around things like uh riding leaping running dancing and um, vomiting diarrhea all of these things that might provoke uterine cr- contractions are acknowledged but i think one of the the really interesting beliefs about what might cause a miscarriage is they they tie it in with the emotions so if you feel excessive sorrow grief or anger all of that causes the blood to to move away from the womb towards the heart and so might provoke you to suffer a miscarriage as well and what about complications during the pregnancy itself or during the labor itself i should say that was one of the main differences really between then and now is that if something went wrong in a labor it was very difficult to recover from that position without the sort of modern technology that we can call on now so that's when when things did go wrong that could be could have tragic consequences very quickly whereas the majority the vast majority of pregnancies and deliveries were smooth when things went wrong then you were in trouble really Mm. and they might think that causes um for that might be that the woman hadn't managed herself correctly correctly during her pregnancy maybe she'd continued working too long or she'd eaten the wrong foods or or something like that but midwifery manuals from the era are really interesting because they tend to skirt quite quickly over a normal birth which you would expect a midwife to be able to deal with and then they tend to devote most of their chapters to describing for midwives how you deliver in in all of those different kinds of cases in in a breech birth or in a birth where the placenta is retained or those kinds of um, things and then there's lots of discussion about the fact that again men might end up being involved in those kinds of births it was usual in difficult births for a surgeon to be maybe called in who would then use kind of metal tools to to how can you say this nicely pry a baby out of the womb and um, particularly a dead baby they might employ a crochet or forceps or something to to help assist in that kind of birth do we see anything at this time that we might call an equivalent to a, a modern cesarean section i think that's Not slightly really. later <laughs> yeah. it was um if if the um, mother was dying then it was allowed to be attempted jane, jane sharp says that in her midwifery guide that that's the only circumstance when she can countenance um, a cesarean being allowed. And then they're very clear that you should position the mother such that her mouth's open so the air can still be going into the system while you get the baby out. But that's the only time that she would allow for that eventuality because she said it's, it's certain death to the mother is what, is, is what she thinks. And what about just dealing with the natural bodily functions of, of a woman? You know, for instance, menstruation. You know, we talked about a little bit about the understanding of menstruation leading to catering the, the ability to become pregnant. But, you know, how is this dealt with and from kind of a, uh, I guess, month to month basis? Well, there's very few surviving records of how people dealt with things like that on a monthly basis, because it's not something you would be inclined probably to write down. Um, in your diary and lots of these things um, were passed on from word of mouth but it's probable that for a lot of people they just got on with life and and um, menstruated into their layers of clothing but for other women who could afford certainly spare fabric they would make some um, rudimentary sanitary pads from folds of linen um, so get, get a square of linen a linen night napkin and fold it up several times then pin it to um, your undergarments this type of thing and then they were in a bucket next to the toilet and when you would got sufficient then you could do a wash with them people tended not to use internal tampon like absorption methods because it was felt very 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 dangerous to let any excess fluid stay in the body so they, did, they wanted them to come away so even when in cases where perhaps after multiple pregnancies you've got a prolapsed womb there's lots of pessaries advised to hold the womb up but they've all got they're all like a donut shape they've got holes to allow um your normal period blood to to come away in that way so i think women dealt with it as pragmatically as they could really if they they had the beans to they used the knee cloths if they didn't they got on with life (laughs) And so one other thing that uh, that brought up as 
we were kind of doing a little bit of background conversation about this, is this idea of, of green sickness, which I'll admit that uh, I had not particularly heard uh, about before. So uh, would one of you like to explain you know, this disorder and, and what caused it and how it was treated? Um, well, I've written a little bit about green sickness in my book, yeah. Again, it's one of those diseases that doesn't easily map on from modern understandings. You can see similarities between sort of anorexia that, looked, that teenage girls might be prone to. You can see analogies with anemia, but neither of them are exactly the same as the disease that's described in early modern texts. Interestingly, green sickness is a disease that's actually got an end date because in the 1920s, um, some physicians wrote treatises saying, right, you know, we, we've cured that now, it doesn't exist anymore. It stopped, you know, so you've got a, sort of like an obituary to a disease. But in the 17th century, it's everywhere. And it's not just in medical textbooks, it's in people's life writing. So Elizabeth Isham writes about having green sickness when she was 16 in a way that she wouldn't have written. I've not seen any accounts of any woman writing, you know, quite in the same terms. Oh, you know, I'm having normal periods. But she wrote that she got green sickness at 16 and that as she was getting over it, her younger sister was starting to show signs of it. But it's everywhere in cultural um, documents. It's in Shakespeare's plays. And Juliet's accused of having green sickness by her father when she won't do as she's told. So it's a disease that's got not just a medical understanding, but huge cultural currency as well. And it's it's symptomised by, there's a range of symptoms. So it's not having started periods when you were, you know, thought old enough to have done so, you were over 14, people would start to be a bit concerned. But it's also about, you know, fatigue, it's about looking very pale and also having a green tinge about your face, you know, because you were pale and being very tired and uh, run down. And there was many, many cures for green sickness, like, like everything. But interestingly, one of the um, cures is going back to the spa cure that we were talking about a little while ago for infertility. And the spa waters are enriched with iron naturally from under the ground so you can sort of see why somebody was a bit anemic why taking a, a spa water would actually heal or steel waters as they were often known is what the hypocrisy could mix up some water that's um, imbued with iron filings left to soak and so it's got some iron in it um, as a cure but the main cure at the time was thought to be getting married <laughs> and um, if you were to have sex then it would it would um, open the the veins in the vagina area and allow you to start menstruating and then Nicholas Culpeper for one certainly says you know if you were then to go on and have a baby then you'd be completely cured and you'd never get it back again because that that was so that was the ultimate cure so I think that that nicely twists back to what we were saying earlier about the importance of motherhood it was thought to be the main cure for a, a disease that teenage girls were thought prone to and it was, as I say, it was absolutely everywhere. You would think there was an epidemic of it by looking at the text because everybody seems to be talking about it. And even to the extent that um, there's a whole project in the North East uh, in, that is looking at fashionable diseases. And I think green sickness could come under that umbrella very easily of being a fashionable disease because um, John Mowbray writes in his medical book in the early 18th century that on the continent, women in their makeup use a green tinge to look as though they've got a touch of green sickness. Because they're coming to that, you know, they want people to see that they're sexually mature, and it's fashionable. And Dr. Evans, do you have do you have any? Uh, I mean, anything to add to that very thorough wrap up there? Um, I think the only thing I would say is that Sarah's suggested there that one of the reasons marriage was seen as as a cure for green sickness is because it helps open the veins of the of the womb and so promotes menstruation. And um, but in some early modern ballads, which are kind of printed song sheets sold very very cheaply. The the suggestion is a little bit more salacious um, in that in one ballad, particularly about green sickness, it's addressed to a father and it suggests that the reason the girl develops green sickness is actually because she's reached sexual maturity and her seed isn't being released because she's not mm. having sex. And so the father should really mind his business and marry her off very soon. And, and in the ballad, she actually finds her own cure, which is a, a very lusty young um, farmer's son. <laughs> And and the warning is for fathers to, to marry their daughters in a timely fashion because this build up of seed will will encourage sexual promiscuity, um, but may also lead to to green sickness and, and being ill. Um, but it's very unclear in some of the medical literature whether it's menstruation retained in the body that's the cause or seed retained in the body that's the cause or a bit of both. Now, what about you know the yeah, absolutely the... and then that dynamic with the oh go, go ahead, Hattery. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, just to say that dynamic that Jen mentioned there with the ballad addressed to her father is one of the one of the most interesting parts about the presentation of this disease. Really, is that a lot of the literature, be it medical or in, in sort of cultural things like um, when I mentioned Juliet's father, is that it seems to be between a father who writes to the doctor about it or a father who's taking the lead in going to get some treatment for it. Um, and I don't, I don't have any sort of idea why that might be but it's an interesting dynamic in the presentation of this, this disease perhaps because it was a father's role to, to make sure the daughter was married in a timely fashion so come to the kind of the the end of menstruation i guess you'd say you know when we have uh, the onset of menopause do we have a particular understanding i would guess still in the humoral system about you know why this came about as well yeah i mean the whole aging process in humoral system is thought to be drying out so it starts right from when you're born and you get less and less moist as you go through your life. Under that sort of dynamic, the idea that you would, by your late 40s, have begun drying out sufficiently that you didn't have the excess blood to menstruate is quite logical. And they thought, you know, the onset was seven times seven, going through these sort of climactic years. Um, so some around about 49 would be about a normal time to expect this to start happening. I think my my kind of favourite cultural or medico-cultural understandings of menstruation are tied in with what they believe happens to women's bodies when they're no longer menstruating. So there's lots of cautions to to men about taking uh, a wife who's past childbearing because she'll obviously have all the sexual drive she had when she was younger, but she knows she can't get pregnant. And so that might put a strain on the man's role in the relationship. Um, But there's also lots of suggestions that women although they're no longer releasing menstrual blood may still be producing it and that it's actually retained in the body and and breaking down and becoming toxic and dangerous and so um older women are seen as maybe slightly dangerous and one of the discussions um i've seen about witches was the older women who'd retain their menstrual blood it became toxic and that that toxic kind of poison was then manifested through their eyes so when they they looked at a, yeah. a young child they were they were cursing them but it was through the toxicity of that blood retained in their body yeah um, i've even seen that expressed as it could kill a child in the cradle just by a glance <laughs> and so to kind of uh, nudge us towards a conclusion here so you you've uh, you've talked a bit about the idea of this time period in england being uh, a marketplace of ideas and what has kind of been striking me as, as we go through, uh, and I listen to you talk about you know, the diagnoses and practices and, and just mental schema about how disease is working at the time, is that it really is. It, there, there's no one kind of particular you know, straight thoroughfare through, but I mean, can, do we see this, this time period from the professional academic historian perspective as kind of a continuation of, uh, of earlier practices or more of as kind of the, the birth of, of a more modern medical practice? If I we can th- even make the, that kind of you know, strict yeah. economy. Yeah, I think it's kind of both. Um, you know, it has been suggested that the 17th century was the era when humoral medicine started to, to fade and disappear. And in, in some aspects of medical practice, that's certainly true. You have chemical medicine coming in and iatromechanical theories of medicine coming in, which all force people to reevaluate humoral systems as a way of thinking about the body but certainly in reproductive medicine and the kinds of issues that Sarah and I look at humoralism stays right into the 18th century but then having said that everything that's going on with anatomy and dissection means there are lots of new ideas around you know William Harvey discovers the circulation of the blood and um, lots of elements of the reproductive body are discovered in this era and um, Things to do with nervous systems start to become much more popular in the early 18th century. And so I think there's both things going on. And and part of that is because of the way information is shared, new ideas are there, but people also continue to to reprint and and discuss in print older ideas. And older ideas are still there in oral discussions and oral traditions and folk remedies. So, So I think it's a bit of both. There is that continuation with past practice, but also some movement towards newer ideas and and overturning some of the old Galenic and Hippocratic notions. Yeah, I think that's very true. I think that that as much as people were discovering things about the body for themselves all the time, that they wanted always to relate it back to, well, how does this fit in with what Hippocrates said and try and somehow square that circle? Um, Because 
it was too unimaginable, I think, to to imagine that it was completely wrong. And they just have to modify it a little bit to fit in with the new ideas. So when you've got the um, I actually mechanical ideas coming in, which is to do with the body being a plumbing system, you can see how that maps quite neatly onto the old um, humoral ideas. It doesn't have to abandon it. It just modifies it in line with what we've just recently discovered and things like that. And so just to ask for some kind of uh, final thoughts from both of you, you know, we, we do think of this time, uh, as we've kind of noted, as not being the most particularly uh, most wonderful time to be a woman in, in, in history. But it, it does seem like there, there was a great deal of knowledge and access and kind of, you know, community support for the women who, who were dealing with both kind of natural physical processes and as well as infections and disease. So uh, could you just kind of uh, give us some some final concluding thoughts about the importance of, of studying women's health in this period? I think that is one of the things that comes out of studying women's health in this period is just how much of a community there was when it certainly when it came to things like birth and Jen mentioned earlier about the gossip attending the birth and diaries are full of um, when in labour um, you'd send for your gossips which is your friends and neighbours and it derives from God's helpers so there's an idea that your friends and neighbours gathered around the birth things were a lot more social in that sense things that are now cut off and very individual you know, you certainly wouldn't hear of many people these days giving birth with half a dozen of their neighbours and their mum and their auntie all in the room. But that was normal. Then. So, you know, that's one of the things you discover when you study the period is, is that there is this whole so- social element to um, these life events, if you like. Yeah, I think I would answer the other part of your question, which is why it's important to look at these kinds of issues. I think as historians, we we often sit down and wonder why is it important to look at what we're what we're looking at. and I think looking at an era like the early modern era, particularly the 17th century, it's it's fascinating because it's both very similar. There are things that we can relate to and understand um, the difficulties of dealing with menstruation or or childbirth, things that, that seem to have not changed that much. And then there are things that are totally alien, the whites, the green sickness, diseases that we're not quite sure how they would manifest now in in the modern era but i think why that's important is that if we start looking at sex and gender and women's lives in the past then we can start to see how all of these things while not entirely culturally constructed are very very heavily reliant on on the kind of cultural framework they sit within and i think that can prompt us to think about things in the modern world, you know, how do we encourage teenagers to talk about venereal disease? Well, perhaps if we showed them that everyone in the the 17th century was terrified of getting venereal disease and was embarrassed to talk about it, then you could open up new conversations there. So I think understanding that that medical science can be different in different eras and can change and and, and that women's lives in the past are different um, and have changed can, can help us think about modern issues in kind of new and exciting ways. Well, Dr. Sarah B., Dr. Jennifer Evans, thank you very much to talking to the Ask Historians podcast today. Um, we look forward to your contributions, both on your own blog, uh, what you give to the History Medicine subreddit, uh, and of course, uh, your actual, you know, your actual academic work as well. I wish you uh, many happy tenured futures. Thank you very much for having us on. Thank you. Thank you for listening. This will unfortunately bring another episode of the Ask Historians podcast to a close. Dr. Reed and Dr. Evans, they can and will go on on these subjects for for quite some time, and they do uh, on their blog, uh, earlymodernmedicine.com. Uh, which again, I'll put a link to that in the uh, in the discussion post. But I encourage you to go check it out, to go read it. You can also see the published little selections on the uh, History of Medicine subreddit, which I also encourage people to read and post and contribute to. Uh, this is, uh, as I said at the start, this is a fascinating topic. Uh, aside from mucking about in Mesoamerica, you know, the idea of disease schema and the lived experience of people when it comes down to their own health in the past is, is, is something of interest interest to me. So I just hope this is as much as fascinating as it was to you as it was to me. This peek back into the past and the way that people, especially in this early modern period, could really have lives that were so close to what we think as being, you know, living in this kind of modern world of understanding of, of you know, the understanding of the body and the anatomy and physiology of it, but at the same time wrapped up in this these ideas which are much, much older and, you know, are, are basically come down to 
uh, people figuring out things with having no idea how the body actually worked, yet somehow it kind of continued and it, it worked sometimes it didn't but you know it, it's this idea of how do you uh, how do you properly diagnose something when you don't know the causative agent behind it how do you cure something when you don't know the physiological processes that are causing it it's you know it's all and it's all wrapped up in this you know folk medicine passed down and then codified you know through these uh, philosophical texts which go into you know universities and the overlap in between them so it, i guess what i'm saying is that i really enjoyed this episode <laughs> Uh, and I would love to have them back sometime to talk about other topics as well. But uh, again, go out, read their stuff, um, buy things they have published, read things they have published in journals. So, uh, and just continue to support your local friendly academic or your um, in a different country academic, as the case may be, if you were not uh, around in Loughborough, uh, which I'm very, I'm still very pleased that I got that mostly right. So coming up in two weeks, uh, in the next fortnight, you will be hearing uh, quite a lot of my voice. I will actually be taking a turn in the guest chair. Uh, Jaffs, Mike, who helps out, uh, is kind of the co-podcast host behind the scenes, will be lurching into the foreground to take a turn in uh, being the interlocutor here. Uh, and so I will be talking about the history of Tenochtitlan and Tlatelolco. That's the two Mexica cities that formed the Aztec Empire nucleus there. Um, so if that sounds interesting to you, or if you have no idea what I'm talking about, I hope to see you then. Uh, and as of course, as always, uh, please rate and review us on iTunes or uh, whatever service you happen to be using. Uh, we're available on a wide variety of, of streaming um, services, and you can grab our RSS feed or simply go to the askhistorians.libsyn.com page and you know download it directly from there. So um, on to the outro. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. For more history like this, visit us at reddit.com slash r slash askhistorians and ask over a hundred historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know in history. Find us on Twitter as at askhistorians and subscribe to the show on iTunes or visit askhistorians.libsyn.com. Thank you very much for listening, and join us next time on the Ask Historians podcast.